I wouldn't say confusing, but tough to kind of grasp. This is one of them. So we're just going to walk through this and get an understanding because it takes a little background of the Old Testament scripture that Paul the Apostle is going to talk about. So we'll go ahead and read 1 Corinthians 14, 20. This is very important. I wanted to stop here because this is a very extensive teaching on the church and the movement of the gifts and tongues specifically, at least in this first section. He lets us know that within that church there were some struggles going on. The Corinthian church, very blessed, gifted, but they were using these gifts not for the edification of the body, but to just show off that they had gifts. And this is key, and I think all of us have to examination. Why do we do what we do. I know some preachers with, with gifts of exhortation and it's not for the edification of the body. It's to show off. It's to show off who they are and how gifted they are. That's the wrong thing. It always has to be based in love. So Paul deals with this. He says, don't be children in understanding. That means as we look at a child, there's, there's a, a progress of maturity. Uh, we understood less as a child and as we grow uh, to manhood or womanhood, we should understand more. But so, time, so many times in church, it seems like we have a lot of babies that are just kind of playing around. The maturity level has not grown. So Paul says, I want you all to mature. Uh, if there's anything, I want you to be immature in that malice. I want you to be bathed in malice. What he's saying, I don't want you to fall out. I want you to love one another. Uh, and then there's a, a kind of a, a picture, you know, little kids can play together. Uh, and, and if they fall out, they get together real quick. But adults, when they fall out, amen, it can be years and years and years. So he says, okay, if there's going to be an immaturity, uh, let it be in malice. Let us get past our issues and let's grow. He says, but in understanding, be mature. And I think this is one of the lacking parts of the church getting understanding. To get understanding, we have to take our time, we have to examine the scriptures, and scriptures uh, interpret themselves by the scriptures. We come together and we're able to talk and ask questions. Paul the Apostle wants to get the church on one accord. Now let's go to this next section. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 21 through 22. Someone read for you. This is a tough one when we try to look in context, and so we're going to kind of circle back to try to get the understanding. But the one thing that we see in 1 Corinthians 14, 21, he refers to a what type of scripture? What does that scripture come from? The law. The law, Old Testament, very important. It's actually Isaiah 28, 11. Okay, so to understand the context that Paul is coming from, we have to deal with that scripture. And a lot of times we kind of go through scriptures, and there's a lot of, Jesus referenced a lot of Old Testament scriptures. You'll see it throughout the epistles. Uh, Paul the Apostle, he was very efficient in referencing the Pentateuch and other things. And sometimes we go through that. And if you haven't read the Old Testament in context, you're not going to understand what they're trying to get within the New Testament perspective. So notice here as we look at that 1421, we see that there's a hinging point. As we go back to the Old Testament, we've got to look at what was it talking about in context? Look at that. It says, next the apostle quotes from Isaiah to show that tongues are assigned to unbelievers rather than to believers. So what does that mean? Were there tongues in Old Testament? So let's look at the context of it. God said that because the children of Israel had rejected his message and had mocked it, he would speak to them through a what? Isaiah 28.11. That was the context. Because the children of Israel had gone astray, God says, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring in a nation that's going to take you over that speaks another language. And when they speak another language, you're going to know that I've allowed this to happen. Bringing it up to our perspective. If God told us and prophesied to the church that we're going to have to go through 
and he's going to allow another nation to come into the United States and take us over, and they're going to speak Russian. We go, oh, no, oh, that could never happen to the United States of America. But if it happened, and then those who spoke Russian came in and controlled, we would go, that was a problem. Right. <laughs> you couldn't understand the language, but yet they're in charge. And so this is the same thing that was happening with Israel in context of this time. God says, there's another language that's going to come forth. You're not going to know it, but I'm going to show you that I'm in charge by allowing this to come. The fulfillment of this took place when the Assyrian invaders came into the land of Israel, and the Israelites heard the Assyrian language being spoken in their midst. This was a sign to them of their rejection of God's word. Now, keep that, kind of put that in your mind. I'm getting ready to kind of deviate because it just hit my heart. I believe that we're in a day and time, and I'm not talking about tongues here. I want to keep that context. But I want you to start listening. You're going to be hearing more foreign language around us. Not talking about Russian or Japanese or anything of that sort, but you're going to hear language that does not connect to the Christian. It doesn't. Just listen. Listen on your jobs. Listen to what people are talking. Listen to the presidential candidates. They're talking a different language. And for those who are biblically based, who are saved, it is not connecting. And sometimes you can tell if you have discernment, they're just going around in circles. And you're like, there is no depth to this. There is nothing to this. What's going on? And, and sometimes you can feel, isn't anybody listening to what's going on? Can't anybody tell that this is just... This is not really substance. There's another language that's going on. And I'm concerned. I am concerned. Our kids are actually being taught this other language. Um, colleges are propagating this other language that has nothing to do with the Bible. And even sometimes in churches you can come in and there's a language that's not biblically based. It's just something that people have produced that has no substance on the inside of it. And we've got to be careful because I think this is a sign of the judgment of God. That we must understand as a church, we got to pray because we're in a dark spot that's going on. And I think this is where the gifts have to come in in a powerful way to give us understanding of where we are. So getting back to context, look at that 1422. The argument is here that since God intended tongues as a sign to unbelievers, the Corinthians should not insist on using them so freely in gatherings of believers. It would be better if they prophesied, since prophesying was a sign for believers and not for unbelievers. Okay, so keep that in mind. We kind of understand that, but there's something within that scripture that, that troubles, and I'll deal with that a little later. Someone um, read 1 Corinthians 14, 23. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there comes in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, but they not say they go out of their mind. Doesn't that make sense to everybody? All right, so we're, we're here tonight, and, you know, I believe that all of us are, are believers, you know, but maybe there are unbelievers here. So all of a sudden we started speaking in tongues, and they just came in, someone from off the street, someone just walked and said, you know what, I want to stop by other people. So we came in, and we're speaking in tongues. And they come in, they're like, what are you doing? They don't understand. They're unbelievers. They haven't been converted. They have had no teaching on tongues or anything of that sort. So what do you think they're going to say? Something's the matter with those folks. They're crazy. This makes perfectly sense to me. Uh, with tongues, if they come in, those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? You ever been someplace like that? You're like, man, something's going on and I don't understand here. And so this is where love comes in. we got to know, especially as we open up our, our congregation, especially on Sundays and we open up the doors, anybody can come in. We, we kind of want those to come in. We do. We want unbelievers to come in so they can be saved and delivered and set free. But we have to have, be a conscious of that to know that maybe service is not just about us. That makes sense? What if God has orchestrated this just for one to come in to be touched. And we as believers have to be sensitive to that spirit that we can hear his word so that that word can get to that unbeliever and their heart can be touched in a, a, a mighty way. And, and we'll explain that a little later. Uh, go ahead, Brother Doris, to read that little section there. If the whole church. If the whole church comes together in one place and all the Christians speak in tongues without interpretation, what would strangers coming in think about it all? 
would it not be a testimony to them, rather they would think that the saints were not the cases? It would. So we won't, we won't because we have an open environment here that when the unbeliever comes in, they have an understanding. They, they really know that God is using us in a mighty way, and those gifts can be used to touch them and touch us. And we'll explain the difference in that. Brother Goins, go ahead to that next one. This is where that contradiction can come in, but we'll try to explain it. But Brother Goins. There's an apparent contradiction between verse 22 and verses 23 and 25. In verse 22, we are told that tongues are signs to unbelievers, whereas prophecy is for believers. But in verses 22 to 25, 23 to 25, Paul said that tongues used in the church might only confuse and stumble unbelievers, whereas prophecy might help them. You see that? That's why I said this is the toughest part because it does have a seemingly contradiction there if you just looked at those scriptures. But that's why we walk through it slowly to get the whole context of it. Go ahead with that next paragraph. It explains a little bit. The explanation of the seeming contradiction is this. The unbelievers in verse 22 are those who have rejected the word of God and closed their hearts to the truth. Tongues are a sign of God's judgment on them as they were on Israel in the Isaiah passage, verse 21. The unbelievers in verse 23 to 25 are those who are willing to be taught. They are open to hear the word of God as is evidenced by their presence in the Christian assembly. If they hear Christians speaking in foreign languages without interpretation, they will be hindered, not helped. All right, this is the context. MacDonald, he brings this and, and gives us a good insight. He actually uses the context of the Isaiah scripture to understand these sections so there is no contradiction, okay? And, and I can flow with that. But I'll also give you another part, an uh, and or. As I've been praying about this and thinking about this, we could also use Acts chapter 2. If tongues are for unbelievers, and we see the context of Assyrians, Acts chapter 2 could actually be in that too. Because remember, um, as it reads, Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? So when the Holy Spirit came down with the images, all of a sudden, it filled them. They began to speak in other language that people could understand. Acts 2 8. And how is it that we hear each in our what? Own language. Own language in which we were born. So these are unbelievers here at this Pentecostal time listening to Peter and the disciples speak in their language. You're an unbeliever. You hear your language. You're going, hmm. They already know that these are Galatians. They don't know our languages. They haven't been taught in this language. Look at that next part. It gives the languages or the dialects or the backgrounds that God is using here. Um, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, uh, Phygera, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in what? Our own tongues. What? This, I love this part. The wonderful works of God. So what God did that day was tongues to the unbeliever because he speaks through these disciples that did not know that language. He speaks in the language of all these people with these various dialects, these various languages are coming. And so that they could understand, they're unbelievers, so they could understand and believe that God was real, he spoke about what? It's in that scripture. What did he speak about? The wonderful works of God. So if you're an unbeliever and you heard this in your own language, knowing that the person who's speaking it can't even speak your language, and is talking about the wonderful works of God, wouldn't you believe? It would, it would touch my heart. So we see here Paul the Apostle can also be taken back in on this Acts chapter 2. Detail. Rather than the Galileans speaking in 10 different languages, they didn't speak in one language, and God allowed everybody to hear it in their own language. There have been interpretations, but I think the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. We know that the room is filled. I think that the languages are going through different people. <clears throat> yes, I, I do. Um, some people have given that interpretation, but I think God is actually using the individual people, and they're able to just hone in on their language. It's kind of like if we were here today and we had different languages, and you know there were several people started to hear those, speaking those different languages. We could hear our language. 
rise above that. That's the way I like to think it because the tongue set upon all of them that were in that room. But that was, it's still a supernatural uh, occurrence, whatever way you think about it. So good point. Any other questions up to this point? All right, let's move on to this next part. Um, it says, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? All right, so, so this whole process with love, if an unbeliever comes in and a tongue is raised and an interpretation comes and it's for them, I want them to understand. And I want them to be back there and go, wow, that, that's speaking to my heart. How, how, did, how did they know? Well, God, we, we're, we're working in love, and it was a setup. We always say, uh, Mother Serena, it's not by chance that you're here. I really believe that. There's no accidents. God, I've heard it too often in Ebenezer. Well, I was just riding by. I, I rode by this church many years, and I decided to just stop in. Well, you did decide, but it was a setup. <laughs> right? God knew. God knew that you would be here, this whole process of setting up. So we have to be sensitive as we're using those gifts that God can be glorified. Now look at this next part, um, 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and 25. Someone read, please. All right, so we flip back. We've been talking about tongues, but remember, he was talking about a conjunction with prophecy. That's speaking a true word of God or a good word of God or a revelatory word of God to that particular person. So now it goes back into that 24th verse, but it all prophesy. All right, we're hearing from God and we speak in a language that everybody can understand or that unbeliever can understand. He or she comes in very, very powerful, a believer or an uninformed person comes in. He is convinced and he is because he can understand. So if I'm up here preaching in tongues, he's not going to be convicted. Right. Or convinced. He's not because he does not understand. So I want to make sure as a pastor that I'm hearing the Lord and that I'm prophesying that God can use me because he wants to speak to the hearts that are around. And he wants to speak through you also, not just me. You can be beside that person. And maybe God is putting a prayer on your heart. Or maybe God is just telling you to turn to your neighbor and just say hello. Or ask them, how are you doing? Or, you know what, I know this is you know, not the, the thing to say per se, but I just feel like I have a word for you. It's going to be okay. That, that's a prophecy. They can understand that, and you don't know what they are going through, but God did, and when you said that, it broke them. You ever did that? You ever just said something to someone? Also, they just started crying, and it was like, oh, Lord, what did I do? I am so sorry. It really wasn't you. It was God. He just, you were yielded to us at that point. God needed to get a word to them, and he just used you in a transparent way. This is what it's talking about, convinced and convicted, and the secrets of his heart are revealed. I mean, there's so many people that come in and, um, and, and they do, they have secrets in their heart. And, and sometimes God has to break that open. Um, a word has to come to just rip that out. And, and, and we need to hear the voice of the Lord because some people have already made a deal with God. You know what? I got this going on. God, if you speak about my issue, I know that you're God. Yeah. Right? They come to church like that. If you... If you speak about my issue, I know you, and God's like, okay, I got you. And so we want to make sure that we yield it so that when God speaks that word, they'll get it. They'll be able to be changed for him. The secrets are revealed. So falling down on his face, we, we talk about that in church, you know, what must I do to be saved? And they'll fall down on their face. Well, we need to be working in the gifts of the spirit that God can convict the hearts, and they'll know God is amongst us and worship God. And report that God is what? I don't want people to come here at Ebenezer and I want them to go out and say, God is in that place. Right? I don't want them to go out and say, you know what? I think God is in that place. But they were speaking so much tongues, we couldn't understand what was going on. And then the kids go out and say, they're crazy. I'll tell you what's going on in there. Right? That's what, cause see, we try to be all spiritual. Even when we don't understand stuff, we try to give people the benefit of the doubt, those who have grown. We're like, yeah, I heard about those tongues and things. That's what they were just... 
you know, God must be you. They must be Pentecostal Baptists. That's what they are. But your kids, they go out, they go, and they sit in their room and go, this is some crazy fuck. It's just as crazy as he can be. And so this whole process, we want to make sure we're being used of the Lord in the proper way. Now we get to the second part, or this, this last one, the order of tongues. Any questions up to this point? Because I love to teach about this part. Any questions? Ooh, praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, y'all study the head. All right, number seven, order of tongues and gifts. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. I want to read. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, let all things be done for edification. What does it sound like? What does it sound like? Tommy? I almost got to sound short. Okay, short, but what's the picture here? Church. It should be church. It's worship. Yeah, it's kind of like church. A testimony service. All right? Now, of course, there are issues that are going on in Corinthians church, so they would come. Just read it slowly. I'm not trying to hoodwink you, hide anything from you. It's right here. It's been here. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, right, each of you has a song, testimony, sir, all right, we have a teaching, pastor, um, they had a tongue, all right, but we know that there are various types of tongues, and we have to assume within that convocation there would be one, or it was supposed to be one with interpretation, has a revelation, we love revelations, right, illuminations, um, has an interpretation, so that tongue would be interpretation. And he asked, he said, but in all of these things, what do we want to see? Edification, Edification means that what? We want the body to be built up, all right? We want all of us to be built up. We don't want it to be about an individual person picking on Tony because he has a pink shirt tonight. I don't want Tony to come in here and he's praying in tongues. He's just doing his thing. And then we leave and we go, Tony was so spiritual. <laughs> right? I mean, really, it, Tony was so spiritual tonight. But we didn't get edified. You're like, God, you see, Tony, he was just talking to us. I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on. He's like, when he must be doing something. <laughs> but, but we didn't get edified, all right? And this is what was happening in the church. People were just kind of taking over with gifts, and it was about them. It wasn't about love. It wasn't about the body. It was about, oh, I got a gift, and I want to show it off, because when I show it off, I'm so spiritual. You hadn't heard, you hadn't seen that in church yet. Yeah. Yeah. It has, it comes. We have to be very careful. I'm spiritual because I can do this. And we don't say it, you know, verbally with our voice, but our actions are, and sometimes we have to be careful. I'm better than you. And, and that's one, been one of my biggest concerns for Ebenezer. As we learn the word, we go through it line upon line, precept upon precept. I don't ever want us to get the idea just because we have understanding of the scripture somewhat and we go into places and we begin to look down on people. I don't ever want it. We need to pray for them and pray that we have understanding. And even the things that I think I have understanding, I'm always got to God. If I don't have this right, make sure. Make sure. For instance, we were at a church, afternoon service. We were there, we had an offering. I actually, I actually kind of like the pastor and everything. Um, and, and then the, the steward or whatever said, um, I think we're going to take up two offers. And the pastor said, yes, we're going to take up two offers. Some of you, because you had the teaching, you've been under our teaching so long, the first thing you said. <laughs> I heard you. I heard your spirit. We <laughs> such an unspiritual church. <laughs> oh, you did. You, you really, you, you, you did. You just automatically clicked. You didn't give me any leeway or anything. You just said, we want to take up one off of our Really, and you were, and, and for the second hour, I saw you coming and you were grouchy. You <laughs> didn't even want to hear. <laughs> Just threw it in. We have to be careful because even that, if we had that attitude, guess what? We weren't in love. What if, and, and I don't believe in second offense per se, but if God speaks it, I still want to follow it. What if? The pastor was moved at that point. What if, really, I believe that one offering is sufficient, but what if for that point, God was doing something else? You know, we were reaching out to bless a missionary or a family or something. He can. We've done that here at Ebenezer. So we can't be so quick to judge. We can say, huh? you know, we've got some teaching and understanding, but Lord, open my heart that, that I may have greater understanding. And this is what was happening sometimes with gifts. We think that we know so much 
we don't. We have to have love. Tony, hit your hand. Yeah, I was just saying, I, I did that. I mean, I said, I'll be honest. When he took up that second arm, don't give it to the pastor. I don't think of myself, I think I'll pay him out of this. He gave me. Right, we just have to be careful. Right, I, said. They, I mean, it's just so many things. And it could be a wrong, per se, but they could have been broke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Right? I mean, really? Yeah. They could have been in debt. They could have been behind on electric bills. There's so many other things. So when we take our teachings, we understand, but we always have to make sure that we're walking in love, that we understand. And even if they weren't mature in that, per se, maybe there's something else that we can mature in. Because obviously our attitude has to grow, too, as we go forth in God and to be able to pray for them. With this church, this is their issue. They were exalting their gifts, and they weren't able to see what was going on around them. It was a hand. <laughs> and see, so that whole process, we have our ideas. Well, this is why we got First Corinthians 14 to keep us in line, right? <clears throat> um, great question. Robert talks about how do we see those who have gifts? The same way that we know an orange tree is an orange tree, or an apple tree is an apple tree. Um, there's a scripture, and I want to kind of take it in context and, and give your gift makes room for you. All right, so. Um, we, we began to see people over a period of time in their character. First we learn their character, and then as God opens up those gifts, we can start plugging it in. And I'll be honest, there's a lot of immaturity in the church amongst our leaders to actually say, that's not a gift for this form. Um, and we've got to go in that. For instance, um, the, the churches, some of the churches came up a long time ago, if someone said that they were a preacher, um, they would have a service for them. And it would be called a trial what? Service. Trial sermon, right? Makes sense. Trial sermon. Trial sermon. And what, what the original elders were saying, we're going to put that person up. As elders, we're going to sit and listen to them. And if they don't have a gift, we tell them. It was a trial. That's not your gift. We love you, but that's not your gift. But what happens now? It's not a trial sermon. It's, it's not a trial sermon because you put them up and nobody has the guts. <laughs> nobody has the guts to do that. Nobody has the discernment to do that. Actually, I think we have the discernment, but we don't have the boldness to speak it in love. Nobody, nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to be Simon. I love Simon because we, at least we need details people. On, on American Idol, you know you go through all those things. We all know some of those folks cannot sing. They can't. I don't even know how they got on there. I just think that they just make us laugh. They can't. They can't sing. And they're up there, and we all go, "Oh Lord." <laughs> See, they wouldn't have had to suffer Simon's ridicule and embarrassment if one of us with discerning gift would have told them in Ebenezer, "I don't ain't for you, honey. You just need to keep singing in testimony service because we'll accept you." But American <laughs> Idol is not for you. And so, Robert, that's the point. The fruits come forth as we discern. And a lot of people are trying to work in gifts that they're not gifted at. Well, and this was the Corinthian. They wanted gifts that everybody could see. They don't want those, those quiet things, those discernment, those. They don't want those. They want gifts that say, look at me, I'm and we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove that just momentarily. They wanted to be out front. They wanted a whole bunch of chiefs and no Indians. All right, so good point, and I'll come back and give even more examples. Yes, sir, but Rick. Uh, back to the second offer. Oh, Rick. <laughs> now, I, I just want to say that uh, I was blessed to be able to go in a lot of churches in my life throughout my travel and business and whatever. But, but we got to be careful. I grew up in this church. I know one church I went to and attended. I used to communion on the second Sunday. When they didn't have it on the second Sunday, I was all out of sorts because that's what I was used to. 
but you have to be careful because you can get used to the way things are done. And you go somewhere else and you say, no, nah, they're wrong. They're not necessarily wrong. You're just used to it that way. And then a lot, uh, by the same token, a lot of people come to this church. Right. They are used to things done a certain way and we do it a different way. As long as, it's, as, long as I see that it's in line with the Bible, Amen. Amen. with the scripture, with God, I can adjust. There is no scripture that says, thou shalt not take up too often. <laughs> it's not, really. We just I just deal with the heart and try to see why we do what we do. But there's no scripture. We take up four or five. We got plates all the way down the line. Y'all come in on Sunday morning. I say, bring y'all and I want you to drop one in every bucket. But we, we look at the heart. We want to be led to the spirit. There was another hand. Yes, sir. supposed to flow. 1427, someone read. Public assembly, we're together. What is it saying? I really want you to verbalize this because these are very, you don't find <coughs> this much detail about a lot of gifts, but you find it with these gifts here. What is it saying? Okay, it's an order. All right, so we got, a, we got one or two. How many? At, at the most. Right? I mean, these are incredible details that God is allowed to be in. So again, if anyone speaks in a tongue, all right, in a public assembly, because we know that we may have others that are in that are unbelievers. This is not a closed section. We didn't say, okay, only people come here to speak in tongues. I mean, we, 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 we haven't said that. I guess we could, in a sense, but then that's another issue, and I got I people running to me, why can't I come? <laughs> anyway, that's a whole other teacher. They would. They run to me. So, so that's another process that we have to deal with. So here, we've got here within a public assembly, Paul puts it out, we can speak in tongues, that gift, the tongue with interpretation. We know that there are various types of tongues, so that specific one, anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three. And in turn, alright, so what does in turn mean? Alright, the tongues can't be coming at the same time. Because we can't understand. So in turn. So the tongue comes, interpretation comes. Someone else has another tongue, interpretation comes. Someone else has another tongue, interpretation comes. And guess what? For that, for that section, we're gonna stop. So it is saying something here. We can be hearing the voice of God speaking, but we don't necessarily have to speak that at that point. He's giving a sense of order, and I'm going to explain that, because we've got to trust God that he's working things out. Now, look at this next section. Keep that in your mind. 1428. Someone read. But if there is no church, let us keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Amen. Great. 
Somebody put in your own words. I don't want you to say I'm leaving you somewhere. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right, well, if you speak in tongues and nobody interprets it, either you got it wrong or there are no interpreters. And, and I've been in sections like that, that someone spoke in tongues and either the interpreter missed it or that person missed it. <coughs> Sometimes we we have to discern. And and some people you can sense that is really character first. And if you cuss and you're you you living an ungodly life and then you come in church on Sunday or whenever and start speaking in tongues, I'm gonna question that. I'm, I'm just gonna question, are you really hearing from the Lord? Secondly, let's say, I don't know your background, whatever, but if you do speak in tongues, I'm not gonna question if you can speak in tongues. But if it's a public assembly, I'm going to be listening for an interpreter. If there's a no interpret interpreter for whatever reason, if you start again, I'll ask you, you know, there's no interpretation coming. Right in scriptures, could you speak that to yourself? Look at this. But if there is no interpreter, am I adding to this? If there's no interpreter, let him... Keep silent. Oh, you telling me I can't speak? How dare you tell me the Holy Spirit can't speak through me? Well, explain. And what? <laughs> do, do we understand that? We're never limiting the use of tongues in the public assembly. But there is, you can speak to God. Because think about it. If you refuse and say, well, I got tongues and I'm going to speak them. And I'm, I'm going to speak them loud. I don't care who it is around here. Well, the scriptures say that you can speak to God. Isn't, isn't that who you're supposed to be speaking to anyway? Unless there's an interpreter, and that's where it comes. My heart. Where is my heart? Is this really just about me? Or is it about those who are in the assembly? Because if it's about me, there can be that personal time. I can speak to God. I don't have to raise my voice above that it distracts from the service or the public assembly. And that's the key. I can keep it to myself. Now, there may be a question. Well, I can't control the Holy Spirit. Okay, hold that because I think we're going to get to it. Right? Keep that, keep that in mind. Okay, keep that in mind because y'all do really good on the job. Y'all do really good on the job. Y'all do really good on the job because I don't, you and Wendy's, y'all in the line, y'all, I don't see y'all just start speaking in tongues, y'all. May I take your order? You just doing in tongues. Oh, I'm so sorry. I always to just. I ain't never heard it. I ain't never heard it. I, I'm serious. And some of y'all do. Y'all have public jobs, managerial, everything like that. I, I dare say probably 1% of a person, maybe that's happened to, but a majority, even the most spiritual people, that is never happened. So why? Okay, just keep that why. We'll move on. All right, there's, there's an here. Yes, sir. Where the books reside,
Alright, let's go back contextually. The first time the Holy Spirit is seen is in Acts chapter 2. How did it happen? What happened before tongues came? We, we want to do scripture. We want to have a scripture. And I'll answer that. A scriptural example. They were in the upper room. They desired the Holy Spirit. They desired the promise, actually. And they waited for an extended period of time. And the Holy Spirit came. Robert, I think sometimes within the church, yes, a pastor can pray for a person. But we have to be very careful that we're being used. Because what I've seen, if I'm not careful, and I lay hands on you specifically to speak in tongues, you're going to look at me different. I want you to connect to the biblical understanding that if you desire this, go to your personal prayer time and seek God and wait on Him. That's how it happened to me. That's how it happened to my wife. It wasn't by laying on of hands, per se, because scripturally we do see... Paul laying hands on, dealing with people. But as you go through, it was a seeking God. Seeking, he said, desire those spiritual gifts. So I want to encourage people not to depend on me. Some people can use pastors as a spiritual fix. I don't want to be your crack. And I'm, I'm sorry if I offend I don't. I don't want to be your, your user that you come and, you know, and, and get you into your fork or whatever. I, I don't want that because you're always going to need to come to me for that. What I want you to do is seek God with your whole heart and you receive. And then at that point, we're, we're not saying not to pray in tongues. We're not saying not to intercede. I want you to pray a long time. I need prayer and I pray in tongues. All of these processes, but he's talking about within the public assembly, I'm thinking about those that are around me. And their hands all over the building that were never, nobody laid hands on them. They just said, God, I want more. And they went to their prayer closet, just like Acts chapter 2, and they waited. And God showed up. And so that discounted the dependency on a man and was on God. And that's why I really believe in Acts, we see a lot. That early church, when they laid hands on them, they spoke in tongues. And the interpretation may have come. Uh, or didn't come, they had to know that this was directly from God because it had never been done before. Now we're in a place that speaking in tongues and all that has become commonplace and people take it for granted. It's, it's like a McDonald's. Can you give me a bag of tongues, please? <laughs> and, and I know the Holy Spirit has to be green. All right? and, and I'm going to explain even more, so keep that, keep that thought. There were some other hands. Yes, sir. context of the scripture, but also it does give leeway in the scripture. Again, I want to stick with directly with the scripture. What does it say? What did we read? If there's no interpreter, keep silent, but it gives leeway. And, and 
It to speak to. It seems that the spirit is speaking. A lot of times, discernment has to be made if it's going to come to a level that disrupts the service. And I use that in a in a good way. Disrupts in an interpretation there. But it, it it reveals in here, and no matter what translation, it's it's literally saying if there's no interpreter, maybe you raise your voice. Nobody interpret. It's not saying that you just shut up and don't speak anything, but it just says quiet it down to yourself. Speak to God. Because maybe the interpreter missed it. Alright? So so it's about love. So I can be I can be about me. This is about me. I'm gonna speak in tongues. I'm speaking in tongues. I'm going at it. And then I stop. No interpreter? Like, these unspiritual people, and I start speaking in tongues again. Like, somebody was supposed to interpret it, and I just keep on. Well, that shows that I'm out of love at that point. That's what was happening at the Corinthian church. Maybe there was an interpreter, and they just didn't. For whatever reason, they missed it at that point. And I just kept on. Well, I'm out of it at this point. Because it says, if there is no interpretation, then I need to speak to myself, or I speak to God. I'm keeping silent. I'm not disrupting the service. Very, very important. So now we're going to have the end turn. So let us get through this, this part. There was a hand. Okay. Uh, some churches have, there has been interpretations. We've, we've had it here in other places. I've seen interpretation. But it is not um, a majority of places. A lot. So I agree with you in a sense. But I think that's a lack of teaching. I think the interpreters are there per se, but as Brother Robert, as we wait on the Lord for, he can use that. We're more open to the movement of the Spirit. But we gotta understand what the Spirit is, and we're gonna talk about that momentarily. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes we don't have the gift to speak in tongues and understand what we're, what we're speaking in tongues also. Remember, it's a various gift. We have the personal tongues that we don't necessarily need to know. That's just under God for edification. But in a public assembly, we're talking about tongues with interpretation. Okay? Very, very important. And then we've got the tongues that are actually a different language. Very important. So a lot of times we try to lump it all in. You shouldn't lump it all in. We're talking about different manifestations of these tongues or the Holy Spirit. Question? Yes, sir. I, I was thinking the same way that Brother Kelly yeah. listening to other people. Just my line of, I, I guess, was thinking with this is that we say the Holy Spirit, and we have to realize, too, that the Holy Spirit is a person. It's part of the Trinity. So it's, it's a part of God. And in the same sense, the part of God that gives us free will isn't lost even in that. And I believe that's why Paul is trying to set it up. Maybe the people who are doing this have not been taught like we need to just be taught about what it is that we should be doing. So in the early church, he wasn't necessarily chastising them of this, but actually setting the order in which God would like this to actually be done. But my thought was like John too. I mean, if, if three people are speaking, why did God say, no, hold, hold up, hold up. It's not your time to speak now. But I, I look at that also as being the free will of the Holy Spirit, because I mean, if we all get on one accord and everybody's in here, you know, anybody gonna be wanting to be in order or whatever. But Tony, even in that, if there's three people speaking and God said, "Hold up," they're not listening anyway. I mean, that shows that's that's a maturity level, a discernment, and sometimes we can hear the voice of the Lord. I really, I think we get excited, but we we shut off another part of us that really wants God saying, "Look at who's around you." And, and that's going to come. Yes, Sharon. I was going to say some great points were brought up. It's about teaching and knowing and knowledge. I was brought up at Pentecostal Holiness Church, and I've seen it done correctly. We were taught the correct way, and I've seen 
people speaking tongues numerous times was interpretation. I've seen people speak in tongues and they were their own interpreter. I've seen people speaking in tongues to their own selves and their separate prayer closets. I've seen it all and I've seen it done correctly. Um, so my experience is so for everything wrong with it and things that you've seen incorrect, right. there are churches that do it correctly. Right. Right. And, and it's right here in scripture. This, this You, the Holy Spirit can fill you. Taught the rules and Taught the, the rules, rules and of the of various of gifts of tongues. Yes, which is what we're doing now. Right. There's no scriptures that the apostles came to them and they said, okay, I'm going to teach you to speak in tongues. The closest we see is what Robert brought. Paul the apostle laid hands and prayed on them and the Spirit manifested and they began to speak. There was no teaching. There was no you're getting ready to speak in tongues. It was the anointing. And, and, and I told Robert I was going to circle around. I wanted to get to this point, but I want to put this. I'm telling you, as we get closer to the Lord, our lives begin in a process of sanctification. God is going to be able to use us in a, a more manifest way that the gifts can flow uh, in a powerful manner. This is the key. I think God has shown much grace to the church because I'm telling you, if his gifts were flowing the way that I believe that he wants, there would be some dead folks. Because when you look through the book of Acts, there were some, the gifts were flowing and all these things. And when you go against God's will and you get out of his plan, people have died. All right? So God sometimes pulls back by his grace and mercy, helps us to have an understanding, and desires people to, to seek him. I think we're in the end time in the church. It says there's a fall away. I think there's a very few quantitatively people who are really seeking the Lord um, for feelings, for his gifts, and to grow closer. I think we're in a society that they're just church goers. Go to church on Sunday, maybe come to Bible studies, but the rest of our weeks are not seeking the Lord. It's not manifesting in the scriptures of God, praying, none of that. We're just church goers. So why we don't see that the way it should, as Santa says many times, is because there's a part of us that does not want anymore. We just don't want anymore. Maybe we've seen a bad way, and you're like, man, I don't want that. And we've never seen the power, and God's like, I want to use you, but i got to be able to trust you. All right? Talking about those various types. There was another hand before I go to that next one. All right, next verse, I want to read uh, 1429. All right, so within this congregation, we've got tongues with interpretation in turn. We've been talking about prophecies, prophet tongues. Um, it says, what? What is the number? Two or three. Two or three. It's amazing he uses that. So we can kind of summarize it, but two or three. Very orderly. Very orderly. There's no crazy stuff going on. Very orderly, if there was someone that was unbelieving, they were like, okay, I don't understand all of it, but at least there was an interpretation. Everybody's in line. They love each other. It's like when you go into kindergarten. The first thing you learn if you're going somewhere is what? Get in line. We can't just have you running through the door all at the one time. Somebody's going to get hurt. Just, just get in line. We can all get in here and get lunch. You can go in the line. Why come into church people get crazy? I'll explain. First Corinthians 14 30. Someone read, please. Yes, sir. Person after 
they stop speaking or either have the church turn out. So I don't know I'm saying if there's not an interpreter, you still going to be to it because somebody is going to talk about it that really don't know how the Holy Spirit is formed and what God is telling them. All right, I, and, and I see where you're coming from. I think the context that we'll stand in context with here is actually switched from tongues with interpretation to just prophecy. Um, this is just speaking. Um, some people get up and say, I got a word, and they yeah. speak. And there would be a judge, an elder, or someone has discernment, and they would say, if this was of God or not. <laughs> it, it, it's an amazing thing because we don't really do that. Um, we, we have a lot of gifts, but we don't have judge. Who's, nobody's standing up and saying, yeah, that's a word from the Lord. That should be the pastors or the elders would be able to say that, but nobody wants to offend anybody. Right? Nobody wants to offend. Nobody wants to take that process. And that's the growing process also that first, by our lives, we can be trusted. And so when you have an elder that you trust that says, I, I, don't, I don't think that's of God, you know, you're either going to get upset and leave or you're going to say, okay, maybe it wasn't of God. Um, maybe I don't have that gift. Something of that sort. But oftentimes we have a free flow uh, of flowing within services, but we don't have anyone to speak up and say, this is out of order. All right? And that's the key. And I think we sense it sometimes, but nobody wants to be accused of not being spiritual. Or what, what we get sometimes, why are you quenching the spirit? Why are you quenching the spirit? Well, what if that is not the spirit? What, what if in that instance, and I think we've all heard someone speaks and says, I got a word, and they say that, and everybody in the church knows it? Who's like, you say, that person just didn't take their medication. <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm, I'm being serious as can be. We're in, we're in a, a multiplicity of people that are coming in. BJ, do we have mental people to come to church? Yes, sir, we do. Right? Right? Do we have demons possessed people coming to church? Yes, we do. Do we have people with issues, literally diagnosed mental issues, and they yeah. came to church and they just did not take their medicine? Yeah. Yeah. So they're coming, they're hearing voices, and they speak a word. There should be some kind of discernment to say, sit down, baby. And hopefully, hopefully they'll hear and you'll have elders to comfort them and to get them the assistance they need, but the congregation can still flow in the spirit and not be hindered or confused by something was not that was not of God. Alright, so that whole process. There's some hands. Let me get this next scripture. Let me get this next scripture. Let me get to the next scripture. Yes, you can. Let me get to the next scripture. It's gonna explain. So let me read that next verse. Uh uh, 1432, please. Yes. Yeah. Skip, go 1431 and 1432. Mm -hmm. And go ahead, 33. All right, we got that. All right, can I have just a few more minutes so I can pull this together? Go ahead, Brother Brian. Um, you've been in the past, and you look over your congregation every time. You, you know what you have here. If someone was to come and tell me, uh, and every Sunday they jump up and start talking about it, and the next time you start saying, Sunday after Sunday you start saying your clock, Falling off, but it's being said or told that they only left because they get tired of it. You know, shot, shot, shot. How would you have uh, a robot? Hopefully, and, and good question. Um, if it was out of order, hopefully that I would grow enough to tell them it was out of order. Um, I would probably use medical teaching. I'm, I'm on the, the edge of, I don't want to embarrass anybody. So, if it's a brief time, I have to make a decision. Am I going to call them out in front of everybody? All right? So, I have to decide that. Um, that takes an assignment. So, me, Matthew 18, I'm going to go to them one-on-one -on -one and say, you know what? I think that was out of order. Um, can you, you know, not do that? But I'm probably not going to do it the first time. I'm going to kind of go, okay, maybe that was just a kind of a feeling. Maybe they didn't have the teaching. And I'm going to gently go forth. That's what I think that I will do. 
um, if it, if but I didn't feel it was abusive. All right, there have been times here, and, and the elders have been, that we had someone that started talking and it was abusive. It was gossiping and everything, and I had to cut it off right then, and we just moved on to something else. Um, and right now, I said, we, we can't, let's keep it moving. And so that just takes the sermon at that point. But with this, this prophecy, it says, for you can all prophesy how? One by one, that all may learn and all be encouraged. So just like our testimony service. One by one, people speak, we're encouraged, we love each other. If everybody stood up and started speaking at the same time, it would be confused. And so now comes to the point that you brought out the spirit moving. Okay, the spirit is moving. I got to say this right now. I don't care. I don't care if Deacon Kelly's up right now. I got to say this right now. Well, 1 Corinthians 14.32 says what? What does this mean? Yes, there's this, I told you, on your job, you control. There is, there is, God has given us a sense of control of that flow. And it's a beautiful thing he's entrusted us with. And the Corinthians had gotten out of order because they weren't allowed love to be there, that they were not thinking about those that were around them. This is powerful. Paul didn't have to put that, but it, it, he put it there. And a lot of churches don't teach that. They don't want to talk about that. It's like... I can just the spirit move and I can't control myself. It's good. It's good. You can. Now don't you, you, you get mad at y'all at home. You've got to deal with the scriptures. You can because you do it on your job. You do it on your job. And you and, and knows the most spiritual in here. When was the last time you had a professional meeting and you just got happy and started shouting around there? I mean like at church. Bucking and all of that and everything. Oh, and you know. No one in here, no, no, no one in here literally has, has probably never seen that. Why? Because we know it on our jobs, we control it. But when we come here, sometimes we turn off of that side that God said, there is a control. I want this to be a beautiful thing. When you drive in your car and the spirit hits you, do you lose control? <laughs> the spirit hit me while I'm driving. Hallelujah! I, I, I can guess anything. And I do a shout. I'm excited. I'm excited about it. But I hold that steering wheel. Am I? Are we? All right, we almost know. Really. Just from my recollection, I know the whole If they can't control it, there's going to be an interpreter. 
So you don't have to worry about feeling like, oh, should I? If God wants that message to come forth in tongues, you're going to do it. You're going to do it loudly because he's going to take you over. And the interpreter will be there. So if you know you can control it, maybe, you know, I just feel like God will lead you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't have to, you don't have to feel so, like, oh, should I do this, should I not? Because if you're holding back something that the Lord wants you to do, he's going to press you until you can't hold it anymore. So I think God deals with us in different ways concerning whether you should do something or not. Because I've done it before where I would hold back, hold back, maybe I, oh, I think I need to tell this person. It's like you were saying, it maybe that you say, everything's going to be okay. But I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. No, I'm not going to do it. Next thing, I can't keep myself together because God is pressing me. I told you to do this. I told you that, yes, that was me telling you to do it. So. And, and, and I do, I see that, and that's a growing process. It's discernment. But Romans chapter 1 going into two, says that there are people that can hear the voice of God and we can shut it off and our heart becomes hard. I've known that. It's happened in my life. I can hear the voice of the Lord, very, but there's some things I didn't do. And guess what? He pressured me off. I didn't do it. And my heart grew cold towards that. So there is there is that, that whole part we can shut it down. And so my, my my big thing is we sum this up and we come back in the morning or next Wednesday and make this transition is that last verse we talked about. God is not the author of confusion. Always keep that. We're saying, I want the gifts to flow. I, I want prophecy. I want tongues with interpretation. I want personal tongues. I want people to feel, be filled with the Spirit. I want you to ask for gifts from the Lord. But when we come into the congregation of believers and unbelievers, I want it to be scriptural that people can be edified, lifted up, and, and even get a word for their lives so that God can be lifted up. So this whole process is discerning and flowing. And when we seek the Lord, we can hear his voice in our own personal time. Then we can be used in a public time. I have a concern with people who are not praying in their own personal time, but yet they want to get spiritual in the public time. I got a problem with that. All right? and, I, and I believe God has a problem with that too. And that's where Paul was talking about, guys, y'all are doing these things. There's no love. Amen. Any other final questions before we close out? Yes, ma'am. I think what you said is so true that, you know, if you're hungry, right, because you haven't eaten, then you're going to have a harder time controlling yourself with your food in front of you. But if you're already speaking in tongues, you're already shouting in your prayer time, then when that comes up again, it's not going to be overwhelming because you do it every other day or, you know, two times a day or three times a day. And so you're more able to control it. It's when you haven't had that time with Jesus, when you haven't been listening to God like you do, that you get all excited. Oh, my goodness, God is speaking to me. That should be normal. You should hear God speaking to you to say you should speak in tongues or whatever and be able to control that because it's an everyday occurrence. It's not just a, oh, this is an Easter Sunday thing. Because of whatever. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. The joys we share as we tarry there, none of us has ever known. Come on to your feet. Let's close out. Thank you.